Today I'm going to talk about types of capacitors. In the last video I talked about capacitor basics. Today I'm going to talk about how they are constructed. In a quick review, a capacitor is essentially two conductors separated by an insulator and the capacitor symbol is two parallel lines with perpendicular lines coming away from them to represent the conductors that are separated by the insulator. Now the way capacitors are constructed are using different materials which give us different properties. One of the types of capacitors that we will see very often, and I will give a picture of here, is the ceramic capacitor. And it's a very straightforward capacitor. It's two disks of metal, one in front of the other with a conductor connected to each one. They're dipped in some kind of ceramic or epoxy material and uh, pretty straightforward, just two plates of metal with a thin insulator in between. And capacitors are good for medium frequencies in uh, radio frequency circuits. Another type of common capacitor is the plastic film capacitor. These are made with sheets of plastic film which, such as uh, polyester or polystyrene and they are coated with some kind of metal, usually aluminum, and then they are rolled up. So you have basically a plastic film, kind of showing it thick here, with a layer of metal on one side, and then you roll that up, and uh, well, actually you get two layers of that, and then you roll that up into a cylinder, have a wire coming out of each end, and they may be constructed in different ways. You might find them in a cylindrical type of uh, arrangement. Uh, more often you find them more in a arrangement like this with the leads usually pretty close to the end because they're going in and lead goes in like that. And they have different characteristics depending on the type of plastic that's used for either voltage or temperature depending on the uh, application. Another very common type of capacitor is the electrolytic capacitor. Electrolytic capacitors are used where we need a lot of capacitance in a small space. And they are made with a metal foil that is, I'll show this in cross section, this is put into an, uh, a bath of either acid or basic solution and then we put We'll put another plate over here. I'm showing it unrolled. So here's a connection to here and a connection to here. And I'll just thicken this up to show that it's a thick metal plate. And we pass current through the electrolyte, the acid or basic solution, and that causes an oxidation layer to form on the metal. A very common construction is simply aluminum with a uh, aluminum on both sides and this is rolled up and often there's paper in between to keep them separated and what that does for us if I draw this in a closer cross section here's one layer of aluminum here's the paper and here's the next layer of aluminum and that this one layer has a very, very, very thin layer of aluminum oxide on it. And so we have a connection here and this conducts through the metal, conducts through the electrolyte, and then the insulating layer is the very, very thin layer of aluminum oxide, and then there's the other layer. And so we have, as I mentioned in the previous video, the closer we get our plates to each other, the higher capacitance we get. So this very thin layer of oxide uh, with the uh, electrolyte as the next conductor we end up with a very very thin layer of insulation and so with a relatively small amount of metal we get a very high capacitance of course this is then rolled into a cylinder and you might find electrolytic capacitors that have axial leads or you might find them with radial leads so sometimes they come out the ends, sometimes they both come out one end. One thing you'll always find about electrolytic capacitors is that they have the polarity labeled. So on the axial leads, there's often an indent on one side, and that indent represents the positive side of the capacitor. And electrolytic capacitors must always be installed in the proper polarity. So 
Most of the time, electrolytic capacitors are used in either a DC application or an application where there's a heavy DC bias so that the alternating current stays in the same polarity. Now, we'll learn more about that in the uh, AC module of this class. We had a bit of a problem with the electrolytic capacitors in the early 2000s and maybe even a little later, which was known as the capacitor plague. Uh, there were some substandard electrolytic capacitors made from uh, a couple of companies at that time and because they were cheap a lot of companies bought those and put them into their equipment and over time the electrolyte the uh, material inside would fail and the capacitors would overheat and start to build up pressure and electrolytic capacitors as a safety measure if you look at the top of one uh, especially the uh, radial lead type, you'll see either an X indented into the lid or sometimes a uh, three little marks. Those are to weaken the case of the capacitor so if they build up too much pressure they split. And uh, here's a picture of some capacitors that have the capacitor plague. You can see that they are leaking electrolyte and of course the capacitors fail. And that was a very common cause of failure of equipment uh, maybe about 10 years ago. If you have some old uh, equipment that has failed, changing the capacitors can often be enough to repair them. I repaired a lot of old equipment by just simply replacing the electrolytic capacitors. Another thing you need to watch out for that just came to mind is if you buy cheap capacitors like on eBay or something, sometimes what you get is unscrupulous companies and often in foreign countries so they can't be readily uh, uh, pursued for a refund or whatever. And what they'll do is they will take a large uh, a capacitor can. I'm not sure where they got these, if they were faked or if they maybe got bad capacitors and took them apart, and they put a little capacitor inside. And so you'd get a couple of leads, and this would say, you know, 10,000 microfarads. And you have maybe a 33 microfarad capacitor in size. And uh, so that was something that happened uh, not too uncommonly about 10 years ago. I don't know if it still happens, but watch out for those cheap capacitors from unknown sources. You don't know what you're going to get. So older capacitors might get the capacitor plague. And another thing that uh, happened uh, uh, over the years is very old electronic equipment with electrolytic capacitors the capacitors eventually dried out. After all, the electrolyte tended to be boric acid dissolved in water, and the water would evaporate. And so very old capacitors, very old electrolytic capacitors, are often bad. So you have some old equipment that's not working, try replacing the capacitors. It might be all that it takes. One thing that's become popular in recent years, especially because of the aforementioned capacitor plague, is solid electrolyte capacitors. These are typical capacitors, but they have a solid polymer, in other words, plastic, as the electrolyte, and they don't have the problems of the liquid electrolyte capacitors. Here's a picture of some solid electrolyte capacitors here, and see what they look like. If you look in equipment today, you'll find that solid electrolyte capacitors are very common. Another useful type of capacitor is the variable capacitor. And capacitors can be made, can be made variable, in a number of ways, all you need to do is either change the spacing between the two plates, that will make them variable, or if you have two plates that you can somehow change how much of one plate is adjacent to the other. And so two common types of variable capacitors. A third type is a type of uh, diode called a varactor diode, but we'll talk about those when we talk about solid state electronics. But a varactor diode, you can change the capacitance by changing the voltage, but that's for another time. Uh, today I'll talk about mechanical variable capacitors. So one type that you change the distance of the plates is a very simple arrangement where you have a piece of metal and a insulator. Let's draw that in Oh, how about blue because we can? So there's a little layer of insulation often made of mica. And then we have another layer of metal and it's bent. This has a hole in it. In fact, they all have a hole in them so a screw can go through it. So there's a screw. Goes into a little threaded nut in the back here. And so as we screw this, it pushes this plate closer to that plate. 
and so we can vary that. Of course, it has a very small amount of capacitance, but it can be used. For example, we put a capacitor in a circuit and put one of these types of variable capacitors in parallel or in series with it, and we change this, it changes the capacitance of the two. So we call that a trim capacitor because it makes a small change in a larger capacitance. So this capacitor isn't much, but it's variable and can tweak the capacitance of this one. Another type of variable capacitor has two rotating plates. So here's a, the axis that it rotates on, and we have one plate shaped like that. And I'll draw the other one in blue. And when they are completely rotated out, one of these is fixed. The other one rotates. Let's say the blue one rotates. Let's say the black one rotates because I don't want to contaminate my blue pin. So if I rotate the black one, then I can change how much of a plate is adjacent. So I've rotated the black one. And so now this much of the two plates is overlapping. So I've increased the capacitance. I rotate it some more and I've increased the amount of adjacent plate. So I can have simply two plates that interlock and rotate between each other. Now, normally what we have with this type of capacitor is multiple plates. So if I look at it edge on, here's a whole bunch of plates here that are connected to the shaft, and then a bunch of other plates that are fixed in between. And so this is looking at it side on and so one of these rotates and the other one is fixed. Here's a picture of this type of variable capacitor, very common in radio circuits. So that's a quick overview of types of capacitors. So we have types of capacitors are just simply plates of metal that are separated by a bit of insulator. Those are usually coated in ceramic and have a ceramic insulator. Those are ceramic capacitors. They have a fairly small capacity but they come in very tiny sizes to oh maybe the size of a quarter and have capacitances in the picofarads up into the fractions of microfarads. We have plastic film capacitors, which have uh, capacities in the large number of picofarads into a microfarad or a small number of microfarads. So it's not uncommon to have a one microfarad or 0.1 microfarad capacitor that's a plastic film and looks something like uh, the picture I have here. Uh, we have electrolytic capacitors, which use a a acid or basic electrolyte to cause a thin film of oxide to form on a layer of metal and that thin film of oxide is a very thin insulator so we can get our conductors very close to each other so the electrolyte is one conductor the metal is the other and the oxide is the insulator so we can get very very close together and get high uh, levels of capacitance here is a typical electrolytic capacitor there's a picture of a close-up and it's just a roll of foil inside of a little can uh, we talked about capacitors acting like a little storage tank well these kind of look like a storage tank don't they electrolytic capacitors may have radial leads like this one or axial leads where leads come out each end and notice this one has the negative mark on it to show that this one is negative because electrolytic capacitors are polarized you must have the polarity correct on them or else they will short out and if they short out they often explode so that's a bad thing you can see at the end of this one there's a little pattern which is a weakness so that if it over pressurizes it'll uh, break open there rather than the uh, capacitor exploding. In the old days these things would explode and this little aluminum can would go flying. I had an instructor in my electronics school who told of a story of a large capacitor that exploded and the metal can hit him right in the stomach and he doubled over. He thought he was seriously hurt but of course it was actually a very light. It's hardly heavier than a soda can, an empty soda can, and he actually wasn't hurt. I had one of them explode in my face once. Fortunately the can itself missed me but I got a big cloud of paper and acid in my face and had to go clean my eyes out really quickly. But uh, most of your modern ones will not explode like that. They will break at the, uh, the little scoring that's in the top. So any capacitor that uses that effect of an electrolyte, which could be this kind of electrolytic capacitor, or a tantalum capacitor, or your solid polymer capacitors, and your electric double layer capacitors, which are often called supercapacitors, will have to be polarized because of the way they're made. If you reverse the polarity, it breaks down the insulation and uh, bad things can happen. This is a plastic film capacitor that I showed in the previous video. Here's a picture of some other plastic film capacitors. And finally, we have the variable capacitor that I have a couple of examples here. So I hope you found this 
video interesting and informative, and if you did, please give me a thumbs up down below as usual. If you have any questions or comments, be sure to put them in the comments section. And if you have questions, if I have time to answer them, I will answer as many as I can, and if I don't, often other people answer the questions. If you found this video useful and informative, please give me a thumbs up down below. It really helps the channel. And subscribe because that not only informs you when I put new videos up, but it really helps the channel also. And a big thank you to my patrons at Patreon. I could not make these videos without your support. If you want to help me put these videos online and keep real vocational education free at vocademy.net, you can go to Patreon slash join slash vocademy and pledge your support. And again, a big thank you to my patrons who make this possible, and a big thank you to everyone for watching.